uh, one day in Delhi, uh, so one talk, uh, summer, I thought naturally it's warm. So very thin cloth uh, in the Exu Hotel. Oh, air conditioning, very, very cool, very cool. I almost changed everything. Oh, such a mistake. Here they are always there. <laughs> <laughs> just, just as you and I were talking backstage, you were saying that you had some unexpected and interesting moments when you went to Tibet in 1998. I was, oh. I'm interested to hear about them myself because uh, I, I don't know those. Well, first of all, I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to uh, tell your holiness how, how difficult it was when I was invited by China to visit China during the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1998. And they wanted me to come and I wanted to go. But I also said, if I go, I want to go to Tibet. No. And I said, yes. And we had a lot of discussion. And quite near the time, I was going to go in September and we were beginning to plan, but I was still insisting that I wanted to go to also to Tibet. And the then Chinese ambassador came to see me in my office in Geneva, and he started to explain you know, about the visit. And I said, but I want to also go to Tibet, so I'm not agreeing yet, because you haven't given me the green light. And he said, completely out of the context, he said, when you come to Shanghai, you will see a sign in one of the parks we kept that sign, and it says, no dogs or Chinese allowed. And I looked at him, and I said, as an Irish person, I understand that. There were many signs, no Irish, no Irish, no Catholics. And he looked at me, and he said, will you send me a history of your people? Hmm? And there are many histories of my people, so I was very happy. I sent him several books. And two weeks later, I got permission to travel to Tibet. Hmm? And I think it was because I had a background that was not colonial. Hmm? It was the opposite. And somehow that was hmm? enough trust hmm? that I could go hmm? to Tibet. Hmm? It, it was an extraordinarily uh, special visit for me. It was not long enough. But one thing I did that I recall vividly, we went to a school in Lhasa. And I had little uh, copies of the Universal Declaration mm -hmm. in your language, in the Tibetan language. Mm -hmm. And we spoke to teachers, and we handed them these, and they had never heard of the Universal Declaration. And I was very happy to be giving these so that they could use them. And then one of my human rights officers who was with me whispered to me that this was probably against Chinese law. But I was the High Commissioner, so I said, I don't mind. <laughs> but, we, we, had, we had a very, very interesting conversation because they had no idea how to use this, you know, they said, but how do we teach this? And I said, you know, you, you don't teach so much as uh, talk about it. Just talk about it with the students and see what they think. And that will be a good conversation. Um, and I was back in China as High Commissioner on a number of other occasions, but I never uh, was able to get back uh, to Tibet, but it was always an issue that I raised. There were always human rights issues that I was being given by Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and China Watch. They would give me the human rights situation over the... And it is... It's, 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 it's very unacceptable <coughs> that the human rights situation in Tibet has been continuing and has not been addressed and not effectively addressed, either from the outside or even more so um, from, from within. It, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking from a human rights point of view. And it's been getting so a lot. So I, <laughs> now I'm, I feel happy. Now here also one spiritist. <laughs> 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 anything in, nowadays, you say anything. I know. You speak truthful, honestly, mm -hmm. they, uh, which not go well with official line. Then they simply say spiritist. So, seems you also have <laughs> <laughs> some activities of spiritist. <laughs> In my visits to China as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
I found it quite difficult to keep the balance because China signed a memorandum with me and my officials to engage in workshops on human rights issues. They also signed the two covenants on international human rights and they ratified the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights, not the covenant on civil and political rights. But I never got satisfaction on the actual human rights problem issues, whether it's to do with Falun Gong, whether it's to do with Tibet, whether it's to do with labor dissidents. And so at the end of my visit, I would have a press conference. And I was very straight. I'm a very direct person. I say it as it is. So I gave credit to China for the workshops on uh, addressing the problem of re-education through labor, no due process, police and human rights, courts reform, etc. And I criticized the lack of movement on Tibet, on there were Tibetan nuns that were jailed at one stage that I was complaining about, and I raised it in detail and got no satisfaction. And then the international media, particularly the US media, would say, High Commissioner slams China. High Commissioner criticizes China. And the Chinese media would say, High Commissioner praises China. (laughs) (laughs) It was difficult. (laughs) Your Holiness, as you know, many of us in this country um, have lost our homes, we've lost our jobs because of the recent economic collapse. Mm -hmm. And people always look to you, you've seen so much difficulty and challenge and, and loss in your life, and you remain so confident. How, how do the rest of us begin to find confidence when <coughs> our lives are unraveling sometimes around us? Yes, it is quite serious and very sad. Uh, but uh, one thing, you see, uh, I feel those people who just you see, they, uh, think about money, their whole sort of uh, uh, interest only money, so maybe even in dream, just the money, 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 money like that. <laughs> you know? So just such people, I think their whole hope rely on money. Uh, so. When this global economic crisis happened, I think much more disturbances to such people. Then another kind of people, yes, money is very important. Without money, you can't survive, you can't work. However, the other values, the very sort of pleasant, or say the family, uh, full of love, compassion, or with uh, compassionate companion to neighbors, or community, perhaps. I think such people, uh, although one side, as in they also pass through the same experience, they reduce the expenses on these things, and sometimes the job less like that. But still, uh, as a person, still I think much happier. <laughs>